Hey out there, we should be live now. Hopefully everything's good and you can all hear me. Um, just wanna say welcome. Thanks everybody for joining and watching. Surprised we already got 100 people in here, that's crazy. I haven't even kicked it off. Um, make sure you guys hit the like button before we uh, go too far. And then if you had questions, I dropped a link in the description just straight to a Google form so people can put them in there and not have to worry about fighting chat spam and having to try to scroll up and down and miss people's questions and stuff. So if you got something you wanna ask, just type it in there. Um, if you got multiple questions, just submit them separately so that, that way I can just go through each one and try to hit them as, as cleanly and quickly as possible. I also had a list of stuff I wanted to talk about. I'm gonna to switch to screen sharing in just a minute so you guys can see what, what I've got on my screen and my quick list of the important things I wanna talk about for MMO development and plans for this stuff going on forward. Um, Eventually, what I'd like to do is um, start doing a lot more of these and start talking about MMO development and even going in depth and showing code. I'm still working on getting approval to go through and show um, some actual live MMO game code so I can show what it's like with a bigger project, how we add in new systems and keep things clean and make it all extensible and kind of make it work so that it's not a nightmare to to build a bunch of stuff into a game with without a huge team. Um, and yeah, that's about it. I'm gonna actually move the questions off the screen because I find that I just get super distracted by it. Or I'm gonna move the chat off the screen and just hit the questions first because otherwise I'll keep looking at it and I'll keep stuttering and stumbling and stuff. So anyway, again, uh, before we go, don't forget to like and share and all that. And if you have questions, the link is in the description. Just drop them in there and I'll try to get to them as quick as possible. Before I do though, I wanted to just go over my quick list of um, important things that I think are stuff that you should know if you're building an MMO. And I built um, quite a few, or I shouldn't say I built quite a few. I've worked on quite a few. A lot of other people really did the, the hard work of building them, I would say. I just added things and extended them and you know helped work on them later. So the first and most important thing that I learned, and I learned this actually before working on MMOs, I learned this playing on M playing MMOs and um, exploiting MMOs, was to, um, I guess just my rule number one, which is never, ever, ever, ever trust the client on anything. So if the client tells you it's doing something, like, and by this I mean like the game client or the player client. So you've got a server, and in, in, in any MMO you've got a server or some number of servers, and then you've got clients. That's the, the thing that you launch, the game that you're playing. It's the thing that's on your local computer. Never trust what that thing sends to the server because there's absolutely no way you can stop it from lying. It could lie about who the player is. It can lie about where it's at, how much damage it's doing. Anything that you take as info from the client can be a lie. It can say, hey, I looted that guy's corpse. You know, like the guy died and I can send a message say, hey, I'm looting that guy's corpse. If the server trusts me, believes me, I can steal that person's items. If I say that, hey, I have these items, these are the items I picked up, not not whatever was really on the corpse, and the server trusts me, you're, you're just screwed, right? You've already, you've got the big opportunity of destroying and ruining your game, allowing people to exploit the hell out of it and allowing people to duplicate items or kill other people or cheat. Like when you see these big exploits in games, the easiest or easiest explanation and what causes most of them is trusting the client. They think that, hey, I got this data and I didn't think to validate this data. Um, and I, a lot of the time it's because people don't even realize that the data came from the client and that the client's a liar. Never trust the client. Somebody's always trying to hack it. And that doesn't just mean like the client's data. Never trust anything that's coming from the client over the network either because you can easily intercept that stuff and change it, morph it, or do whatever. Also, don't send the client any extra info that you don't want them to know because anything that you hide in the client code, people can find. People can make a little exploit. People can read the network data. People can see it. I mean, I remember even in the early days of EverQuest 1, little tools that would show you everything that was in the zone. You could see every NPC that was in the zone and the guys that held weapons, you could see what items they had on them for loot. So you could go in, check a zone and see if there were rare guys up and if they had their rare spawn or their rare item on them and you could track them down with a little map and go find them and kill them. These kinds of things happen all the time just because people don't really think about cheaters and exploiters and trusting the client. Now, if you're starting off in an MMO, 
first one you're building, it's going to be easy to make this mistake because you just want to get things working. But you really have to think about building your stuff cleanly enough that it's easy to check and verify everything on the on the actual um, server and client so that you're not just checking it in one spot. Um, hopefully I've hit that enough, but I know that people will still struggle with it. So just remember, rule number one, never, ever, ever trust the client. It's always lying. I want to also hit... Um, there, I know there are a lot of questions about networking, so I'm going to get to that in just a little bit and probably go through it with questions. But I wanted to talk briefly about saving the data too because this is another thing where all of this has to happen on your server. Where you're saving your data, it's, it's never, ever, ever client-side. There are a couple things you'll save client-side. I, I lied a little bit. Like uh, hotkey setups could be saved client-side. I generally wouldn't. But some local settings may be saved client side too, like uh, graphic settings, things like that, where it might vary depending on the device. Things like even hot bars or memorized stuff generally should be saved on the server side because your player is going to log in from multiple systems. They don't want to go back and reset up their character, and they shouldn't have to. Now, the way that we save this stuff is usually with um, some sort of a database. Now, not all games use a database to save their stuff. For instance, uh, EQ1 used flat files and folders to save all the data, which worked fine at first. And back in the day, using a database was hard and expensive. Now it's easy, and I'd say there's no reason not to do a database solution or a NoSQL type solution. Personally, I really prefer the relational databases just because it's a little bit easier to enforce the schema. It's easier to query, and um, I don't generally need too much in the lines of performance when it comes to reading and writing from like persistence type data. I also want it to be ACID compliant. I want to make sure that anything that goes in there is, the, or that there's no contention or competition between writing data and loading data. Uh, it's not necessarily a problem with all the NoSQL solutions that are out there now, but I still am just a big fan of things like uh, Postgres, SQL Server, or something like that. Not Oracle, I hate Oracle, but that's just because it's so much harder to use as a programmer than all of the other solutions, at least it was for me. So <laughs> I would say you, so what you'll want to do there is make sure that you're just saving all of that data off um, on the server whenever something important changes. And that's another thing that's important. You need to make sure that you're saving this data when important things change. Now you might not necessarily write directly to a database when the important things change. Like I picked up an item, I gained a level or I gained some amount of experience or whatever but you're gonna wanna at least save it to some cache that's then gonna save to a database. Of course, if you do that, you need to make sure that that cache is the source of truth and that you're not reading from the database and writing to a cache. This is another cause of big exploits and dupes when you have things that are reading and writing data kind of willy-nilly where you've got like a, you know, one one server is writing, hey, I just uh, traded this item away or I just dropped this item or whatever. And then another server is reading from the database, oh, hey, he has these items. And then suddenly you've got the item dropped on one side and then picked up on the other side and you've got a dupe. All kinds of, I've seen this like a couple of times in different games. I remember one of the first bugs that I found when I started working on Vanguard was very similar to that. You could die, I think it was dying while zoning and you would end up leaving a corpse with the item on it because the call to make a corpse was there with all your items listed. And then there would be on the other side, hey, we're loading this player and here's all your items because we haven't saved off that you have a corpse yet or the database part hasn't finished the update because it was on a timer and we we're no longer using a single source of truth for that cache. Instead, every server had or every zone had its own source of truth. And it was a big problem because then you read data and you write data and then the data doesn't match up anymore, which also just kind of brings me to items. When you're using items, don't recreate them. This is, um, I th I'd say, a big problem with just MMOs in general. When you make a new item in a game, that should be a very, very constrained and limited thing. There should be like one way to make an item and items should not just get recreated when they're traded or modified or anything else. There should be one entry for the item and just the ownership of that item changes. So you've got one entry there, never gets added another one. And the same with like in memory, you don't wanna be creating new items in memory because then your database system magically stores them as new things because it doesn't recognize them. It says, oh, hey, this is new, so let's go add and update it. So you gotta be really, really careful with that kind of stuff, with just 
saving your data and writing your data in general. You want to make sure that there's always a single source of truth and it can't be a single source per server. It needs to be like a single, single source. I'm a big fan of memcache type systems like uh, memcached or, um, oh man, my brain is totally failing me now. But there are a lot of them out there. These memory cache systems that are just distributed and they're super fast stores where we can pull data in and out. They work great. Um, or something else. You definitely just need to make sure that you're not reading and writing from two different systems. Um, let's talk briefly about networking because there were a lot of questions about networking. So um, let's see, what's the best way to learn networking? Uh, I'll just talk about it and then I'll hit the questions because otherwise I'm going to sit here reading questions for too long. Um, in general, the network layer is extremely important in any multiplayer game. In an MMO, I'd say it's as important as a first person shooter, but your requirements are a little bit different. So like when you're building an FPS, the biggest things that you want are really fast, smooth gameplay where everything is really well predicted and it feels like buttery, right? You want it nice and snappy. Everything is good and really responsive. You want to see that when you move on one screen, your other screen is moving almost or ideally exactly along with it. In an MMO, it's less about that exact tight precision because we're usually not aiming with like a straight shot to the head. It's much more about the scalability and all of the other things that come into play. So when you're building a first person shooter, um, you know, you've got multiple players there, they're shooting at each other and that, that needs to be fast. Am I, oh, I'm on full screen. I want to go to um, desktop view so you guys can see my beautiful little text pad notes. Um, so it's a lot less about that, that snappiness and shooting people in the head. And it, there's all of these other things going on that aren't just you and the other 16 players or however many people there are, 100 players. There are hundreds of different NPC type things walking around. You, know, you got bats and rats and cats and spiders and orcs and stuff all moving around. Some of them are fighting. Some of them are casting spells. Some of them are dying and turning into corpses or just new things are spawning objects are moving and you need to make sure that your system is built to handle that more so than the snappiness um, the snappiness is still important you want to have it good and smooth you don't want it to feel like crap but the harder part is definitely getting it very scalable so that you can handle hundreds or thousands of entities all moving around and replicating properly to the people that they need to replicate to um there's also spells being cast and just all kinds of things are going on. There are thousands of network messages just flying around. So there are a couple of really important things to do. First is, well, at the lowest level, you want to make sure that your networking system is as optimized as possible. You want to minimize, if you're in Unity, you want to really remove all garbage collection from it or garbage allocation. You don't want your networking system building any new garbage that's going to slow your game down or cause garbage, al garbage collections later. So... If you've got a networking system, every time you send a message generates, you know, a couple bytes or a couple hundred bytes of data or garbage, I mean, uh, eventually that collects and then you get a little server spike and then it collects and you get a little server spike and you're screwed, right? Because you're just constantly going to get these spikes. The more people get on, the more it's going to spike and the faster it's going to blow up and the more stuff gets in the zone, the faster it's going to blow up. You also really want to minimize the amount of data that you're sending. So there's the, at the very basic level, you want to be packing the data and you want to be using just a good network library. Um, the one that my buddy Kyle recommends all the time, and he's kind of the, the networking pro for me, is GNET. And that's what we've built on top of is just a, a GNET-based system that's super fast. And also, it's set up to just not generate any garbage so we don't have these problems. You know, and, but you really also want to keep the number of messages that you're sending down. And don't just keep sending the same data over and over. So for instance, say you're sending some text info, right? Like you're sending some quest text or some ability text, like the name of a spell. You don't want to send that down every time it's needed. You ideally want to send it once and then cache it locally and then only send it again if it's changed or maybe on the initial login or something like that. Depending on the type of data, you don't want to send it until it's needed and you don't want to send it again unless it's changed. And that's just to keep it keep the networking down. And again, you got to think about this in the scale of 
What if I want to have 500 players sitting in this area? If I'm sending them all tons of text for no reason, I'm just killing my network bandwidth and I'm making it harder and I'm cutting down the number of players that I can have. You know, get rid of all that crap and go up to a thousand players and have everything be nice and smooth. So you really want to minimize those messages um, and keep them you know, only sending when something has actually changed. Don't send state data that hasn't changed. You want to send state deltas, ideally. Let's see. Um, I'll talk more about networking stuff in a little bit because there's there's a ton to it. As for like existing network systems, there are quite a few out there that will work pretty well, but I don't know of any that are perfect for building a first-person shooter or an MMO currently that um, are just off the shelf where you're going to be completely scalable. There are plenty that will get you to the point where you can build a game and have a totally playable game. You may run into network problems later on down the road, and I would say that's probably fine if you've built your game in a way that it's easy enough to swap out your networking layer. And that's, I guess, probably a big talking point I shouldn't just uh, skip, which is make sure that you've abstracted away the networking and the messaging so that you can swap these things in and out. If you build a new network system, you don't want to have to rewrite your entire game because you've got calls that are low-level network calls everywhere. It should be a very simple system with a simple interface to call things, just kind of like the general RPC systems that you see in Unity or in a lot of the, uh, the built-in, or not built-in, the off-the-shelf systems that are available. So use something like that and follow those patterns, and it's not too hard to make the swap. You know, getting the Delta stuff, just sending Deltas, it would take a little bit more work. But overall, um, if you can build it so that it's swappable, you can at least build your game without having to build that system first. And it depends a lot on where you're at. If you're big and scalable, um, you want to work on this networking system pretty early. Like you got a big team that can build this stuff and really has a lot of networking experience. If you're a smaller team starting out, then um, build your game. Oh, sorry, Skype message is popping up. Build your game and then worry about the optimization stuff afterwards because it's very easy to fall into the trap of, I need to optimize, 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 and never actually building a game. And that's not useful at all either, right? You're better off with a game that runs like crap than never getting a game done because you're working on the other things. Um, that said, networking is super, super important. So um, hopefully that I, I got that across. A um, couple other things I want to talk about here. Server ticks. Um, I'm going to skip that. I, well, I really, I guess the core thing here is that like, if you think about like a first-person shooter... Uh, server tick rates are usually like you know, 30, 60, 100 ticks a second where it's just updating and processing the data. On MMOs, it's dramatically lower, like 10 to 30. And that's just how often we're checking for data changes or how often we're processing things. So uh, if you're wondering about that, like server tick rates, almost every MMO I've ever worked on was at 10. So that's just kind of where that's at. And I just wanted to mention it. And then tooling. Tooling is extremely important in an actual MMO. And that's because an MMO is basically a couple systems and a ton of data. That's what, what essentially comprises an MMO and a good, num a good amount of art. But if you look at any MMO you've ever played, just think about all of the items that are in there, all of the quests that are in there, all the abilities, all the NPCs, the dialogue, and all of that stuff. That stuff takes more time and energy than I'd say that most of everything else, or definitely more than the code side. And it's stuff that you're going to be working on with a lot more people a lot longer than you'll work on any one specific code system. So people will be creating quests and NPCs and items for an MMO long after there are no programmers left on the team or the team is tiny, tiny and shrunk down. So anything you can do to make that easy and fast is a huge benefit. So I would say if you're wondering like how important tooling is, it's probably number two, number, number one or number two on my list of important things for an MMO to get right and have really, really good. You want your tools to be extremely user friendly. Uh, you want it so that designers, your people that are going in and creating your world can do it with ease and kind of smile and get anything done without even needing to ask questions. If they have to pause and ask questions and try to figure out how things work and ask you how things work, you're just killing performance. You're wasting tons and tons of time. And any little tool thing that you build can save you know hundreds or thousands of hours of design time. You can save multiple jobs worth of design time just by putting together good tools. A team with good tools can build something amazing that 
a team without tools who like 10 times the size couldn't accomplish. So you really want to have good tooling and you have to think about it a lot. So it's, um, I, I like to show some examples of some tooling stuff eventually. I don't know if I can, so I'll wait until um, somebody approves it. But eventually I'd like to show some examples of good tools and um, how, to, how to put those together and kind of how they look. And it, it's actually kind of a full-time job to build tools. In fact, I've talked about this a bit before in the past, but my first MMO development job was just building tools, which might be partially why I'm biased, but also just the benefit that you get there is huge. And getting a tools development job is relatively easy compared to getting a game development job because there aren't a lot of people that apply for them. And there aren't a lot of people that have the cross skill set knowledge because usually you're going to need to build it in something slightly different than the game, depending for an MMO, especially just because there's so much data that getting those into an in-game editor tends to be pretty hard and well, really pretty crappy. I mean, you imagine like everybody here has probably used Google Sheets and Google Docs, right? Like it's a whole lot easier to write, a, put together a sheet in there and fill in data in there than it is to go into you know, a Unity form that you've built inside of Unity and put all that stuff together. It's also a whole lot harder to just build the things in Engine and in the editor. And it's really time consuming. You really want to optimize for speed, copyability, pasteability. You want your designers to be working in a very natural flow. That said, you also want them to be able to use and update their data live. So like, um, for instance, with Pantheon, it's set up so that Designers can go in, they can save data, they can make changes, and then they can just type a little command and reload whatever data they want. So if they made new NPCs, they can reload NPCs and all of the new NPC data updates on the server right away, and then they've got the new data there instantly. So they don't have to go through a long process. They don't have to wait. It's literally like two seconds turnaround from when they hit save and hit that button to their new data is there and the server's up and running and working. And one of the ways that that really works well is by caching all of this stuff too. So we use uh, dictionaries to cache all of the items or abilities or anything by ID. And then everything references those things by the ID in the cache instead of keeping a local copy of it, which also helps for performance and memory utilization. It's kind of following that flyweight pattern of just having one copy of the data and everything is accessing that data. And then we just can easily swap the data out and we just do another dictionary lookup and find the new one and we're all good. And it's nice and fast and it works great just for making all the data really easy to work with. Um, which actually I just kind of talked about data management. Uh, Multi-server setups is something else I kind of wanted to talk about and I was partially just because I wrote an email about it. but. It's something important to just remember that when you're building an MMO, you don't just have a single gameplay server that everybody's connecting to. If you do, it's not going to scale. I mean, event you can maybe get up to a couple hundred, maybe even a couple thousand players on there, but you're not going to scale beyond that. You're going to have either multiple different realm type things where you have like whole server clusters or, you know, even at the base level, you're going to have multiple servers for different areas or different types of communication. A lot of time we'll have like a world server that's handling world management of spawning different zones and connecting players to those zones. Um, we'll have zone servers where it's like, you know, imagine you're in a dungeon and that's got its own server and everything going to that instance of that dungeon is is uh, just on that one server. And when we go to instancing, we really like, a lot of the time, there are two ways you can do it. You can either launch up, um, multiple instances in one executable. So you got one process running multiple instances, which is optimal. That's really where you want to go for that kind of thing. And you're using some network segmentation to separate out who's seeing what and how the zone's working. Um, the other option, the simpler one, is to just have multiple zone executables that are running and then you're connecting to a different one of those. And each one of those is like kicking off with its own IP, maybe on its own box in AWS or Azure or whatever you're using. And then it's uh, connecting to that world server, registering, saying, hey, I'm here. If you have any players that want to go to whatever this zone is, you know, like uh, you want to go to Lower Guck, then send me a message and tell me and tell them to connect to me. And then your world server will say, hey, Guck, uh, which was a, just an EQ1 zone. Um, this player wants to connect. Get ready for them. Here's their IP and their token. And then you tell the client, hey, go connect to this IP with this token. They make the connection and they're good. That's kind of how you tie these things together. 
for the most part. Um, there are some other ways to do it that are a bit more complicated and interesting, but I don't know if I should just dive too deep into that. In fact, I kind of just want to jump into some of these questions and see what people are asking. So what is the best way to learn networking for someone who only understands Unity C Sharp code and has no other coding background? Um, ooh, that's a good question. I'd start with something very, very simple. Set up um, some simple TCP communications where you just connect two clients. Um, UNet was a good way to do this as a very simple example. Um, Photon or something could be a good starting point, but I think just to begin, I would just work with some very simple TCP connections and then start worrying about UDP shortly after that. Because in general, for game development, we want to use UDP for just about everything. But TCP is, a, I'd say, a little bit easier to get started with. And it'll work when you're be at the beginner level. And then eventually, you'll see those pain points, the problems that come with TCP, which is mostly just performance. And, and then you'll understand the benefit of going to UDP. If you, I think if you go straight to UDP, it's kind of hard to see the benefit and you might end up recreating TCP accidentally. A lot of people do that. They'll start with UDP and they'll keep adding and adding and adding and suddenly it's it's just like TCP but slower. Um, so you, you wanna kind of get used to the two different ones but start with very simple TCP stuff. Um, let's see, I see somebody talking about choo-choo and guck, nice. <laughs> So how does one go about learning to and subsequently programming a network stack capable of performing real-time multiplayer responsiveness, such as Overwatch and such? Long answers too long, stand for a simple pointer. Ah, there are actually really good blog posts about this. Um, I don't have the links to them directly, but I can find them and maybe drop them in the comments. Or if anybody wants to just go look them up real quick and pop them in chat, that'd be great too. But there's... Uh, Valve has a couple really good articles on it. I think there's um, an Overwatch article on it too that talks really heavily about how to set these systems up with good network prediction and um, the state delta stuff so that it's very simple to understand and use. Uh, the Unity ECS multiplayer project does a lot of these things too. The code um, is probably a little bit confusing if you're not used to networking code though. So I'd look at these blog posts first. So I said there was one from Valve and there's, um, I think there was one on Overwatch specifically. And I'm trying to remember, there was one other really good one that it's just totally blanking on right now. But if anybody has those handy and just wants to paste them in chat, that'd be awesome. Let's see, do you have, oh, yeah, no, that's right. Do you have any practical examples slash resources of dealing with things like <laughs> client side prediction, especially with C Sharp focus? I'm using Dark Rift 2 to learn net code from basically the ground up and getting basic movement synced. It isn't really the hard part. Oh, okay, yeah. So it, in here, it's just about that interpolation and prediction. And it's also about speed. So a lot of the time, um, people will try to interpolate and predict stuff and still use TCP. And then you're having to do a lot more work to get worse results. So you want to make sure that that low-level system is really fast and only sending those deltas or the inputs to control the deltas, ideally, uh, or especially for like a first-person shooter type thing. And that's pretty much what they're doing if you look at uh, the ECS demo. But yeah, I think if somebody has the links, please just drop them up in there and, uh, and we can go through them later or something, or everybody can take a look. But there are a couple of really good articles on it. And like I said, if nobody does, I'll put them into the, the description as well. Okay, how would you handle skill sets like making JSON scriptable objects to make it easier to add after deployment? Ah, uh, so this depends. If it's an MMO, I would not use scriptable objects for it because you want this stuff to all be in a database You want it, or some remote data store. Maybe it's not a database. Um, like I said, some people still really prefer having flat files that they ship or binary data files that they ship. Um, I'm a big fan of databases though, just because it makes updating the stuff so much simpler. If I want to make an update to a live server and I've got a database there, I can get on with my tools, maybe connect directly or have some other tool that connects and transfers data from my development environment directly to my live servers. And then my live servers can just reload their cached data from the database or again, ideally from some shared memory cache so that they don't have to all constantly hit the database 
there's just a cache server that hits the database. The cache server looks for updates. Servers look at the cache server and say, hey, give me your data, and then they cache their stuff locally as well. Lots of caching to keep things really fast and keep it really fast, easily reloadable too. That's another thing that I think is really important is making it so that your data in your MMO is reloadable on the fly. You shouldn't have to kill the zone or kill the server and restart it to update your data. If you can set it up so that it's hot reloadable, it'll save you a ton of time. Just think about when your designers are in there tweaking some values, they wanna add in, add some damage to a thing or add some effect to a spell. If they have to wait three minutes to test it because they're waiting for the server to come back, to go down, come back up, reset up their test setup, you're just burning hundreds or thousands of hours or you know th hundreds of thousands of dev hours maybe over the long run you're just wasting time waiting for things and it's just like for a programmer you have that context switch when you stop and wait for things designers are going to get it too they're going to lose a ton of time if they can hit a button reload it and see it instantly and then hit a button reload it see it instantly or even better they can save and have the option just tell their server to or tell their client to request the reload automatically you're saving them a lot of time, you're saving yourself a lot of time, and you're making it so that they can spend their time on the interesting creative stuff and not so much time on the sitting around waiting for stuff. Okay, let's see. What else we got? But that's it. If it's a single player game, scriptable objects are fine because you don't want to have a server. You just don't want to be connecting to it. You just want to deploy it out. In that case, I'd use something like um, scriptable objects or JSON or even a local database that's exporting to JSON data and then it's pulling it, depending on how I've got the tooling set up. Probably though, depending on the scale, like I said, out, outside an MMO or a big scale game where I've got tons of data, scriptable objects would probably be a good way to go. Okay, does server client architecture differ significantly between always live games like MMOs and RTS? Yes, dramatically. Um, and so does your networking stack, right? The server client stuff, like in an RTS, a lot of the time, oh, almost all the time, you really want your clients to also be able to work as servers. You want them all to be in it's what's called lockstep programming or lockstep networking. And you're going to build a completely different system from for that than you would with an MMO. In an MMO, you're going to have a very client or server authoritative system. In an RTS, you may have a very authoritative system, or you may have a system where um, you know it's just locally hosted on one of the systems, and then the other systems can validate the info. So all of the games or all of the clients are running all of the logic, and then they're validating with each other to make sure that nobody's cheating. That's why you would get these out of sync errors because they weren't handling the things getting out of sync when something went too fast or too slow. Um, there are solutions around that. RTSs are something I love and I definitely wanna build, but I've never had the opportunity to build my own RTS um, just from scratch. And that's something I really wanna do long-term though, build like a giant massive, like, I don't know, 100 player RTS with giant maps that has four hour games. I don't know, I'm weird and I think it would be fun. So. Well, I'll talk about that a lot more whenever I do it, though, which hopefully will be sometime in the near future. <laughs> okay, what's the best way to approach saving player state, avoiding duping, but also keeping performance in mind when not writing to the database for every action? Caching. So in that case, um, writing to a shared cache, like a memory cache or something else, or preventing multiple systems from writing to the database at the same time. That's another alternative. I would say go with both so that only your cache server ever writes and everything is instant to and from that cache server. You're just making small incremental changes too. Don't write off the entire character. That was one of the problems we had on EQ2 that made character persistence really slow was it took all of the data, serialized it into binary and then had to save that and it didn't have a good easy way to save deltas for a good chunk of the data. Some of the data wasn't like that, but a lot of the player data was like that. So eventually as things grew, the saving time got slower and slower and slower. And I don't know, I assume somebody has resolved it by now, but I don't know how they resolved it. Um, I would say minimize the amount of stuff you're saving, try to only save the deltas. And again, only do that through a cache server to get really fast performance and have it be all working. Again, uh, systems are pretty fast now too. So if you're not at a huge scale, it's not too hard to do that without worrying too much about it. But I would say put in the cache server anyway. Let's see, sorry, Google just scrolls up. Let's see what else we got here. Is there ever a point 
where when somebody is developing an RPG that was intended for single player, but somehow the game mechanics work so well for an MMO that it would be wise to change it to an MMO. I would say no. Um, I mean, when I say change it to an MMO, you're really rewriting it. You could do that. Like if you've got a game and you're like, hey, this game should be an MMO, let's change it. But just know that you're making a new game and you're making a new game that's 10 times harder to make than the single player version. You're not just like, it's not an easy swap. It's not an easy change at all. It's extremely time consuming and it's literally 10 times harder to make an MMO than a single player RPG at, at least. So, and that's just in the amount of effort and the amount of energy that you have to spend. There's so many more things that you have to think of and every problem is harder. Every single thing that you do is going to be more difficult. Everything that you do requires messaging to and from a server, server validation of stuff, optimization of all that, and then realization that things will change and states will be totally out of your control because there are all these other players controlling things. So I'd say if you can do it, but I'd probably finish the single player one and then see if you want to make the MMO later. So how would you architect a skill slash upgrade system where upgrades can do a wide range of functions from stat boosts to passives or active abilities? That's a great question. Um, I like to set them up with abilities that have either some scriptable system in them or just some simple effects. So um, let me just pull one up. I'm sure this will be okay. Let me pull up my test.json ability. I've got my ability editor right here. So if I want this, for example, is uh, an editor I made for MMO development, and it's just set up as a test.json. Just one of my test abilities, and it has multiple effects, and you can keep adding in effects or copying effects. So this one, you see, like it does a thing, it adds, does some damage to the offensive target, and then this one does some more damage over time. And then I can go in here and add in another effect that you know maybe targets myself and heals for like 20 to 30 and give it some, some um, scalable amount, right? So what, what this essentially is, though, is two sets of data. There's an ability with like kind of the core info about what's going on, and then there are all of the different effects so that designers can build up whatever kind of functionality that they want so they can make it do all kinds of crazy different things. They could target all kinds of stuff, switch in AOE effects, non-AOE effects, and it gives them complete flexibility without me having to go in and code new things every time. So if the designer says, hey, I've got these abilities, I want them to do this, I don't want to be hard coding that. I don't want to code how that ability works. I want to give them the flexibility to make that because they're going to change it, and they're not going to change it once or twice. They're going to change it a dozen times. You know, and it's going to change even more than that after the game's out. They're going to want to tweak things, adjust things, add new functionality, make it modify how it works when you're this thing or when you're getting cast on by this other thing. And then way beyond the player abilities. So when you think of an MMO, player abilities are usually what everybody's thinking of when it comes to abilities. Uh, they're like, oh, yeah, well, my clerics have these 20 abilities, my warrior has these 30, and so on, right? Um that's not where the majority of the abilities are. The majority of them are in NPCs. It's all of the things that the things that you're fighting are doing because if those don't have a big variety of abilities, stuff gets boring really, really fast. You want to give them the functionality to do all kinds of crazy, weird stuff and mix and match things and come up with new ideas um, and be able to implement them without having to wait for you. If they have to wait for new code every time they want to add in some new little weird thing into an ability, they're just not going to do it and things are going to get boring fast. So giving them full flexibility and like I said, it's essentially an ability and a list of effects and then those everything can kind of target independently, act somewhat independently and ability will just fire off any number of those effects based on what's valid or not. And we'll control like whether or not somebody can use the thing and handle the costing of stuff like taking your mana or your endurance or whatever it is, or you're, you know, eating a bandage or whatever, eating a bandage, applying a bandage, I mean, eating by taking it or eating a food or whatever the thing is, right? So it can handle the costing and all that stuff or I'm playing some visual effects. But you get the idea. You really want to separate those both out into two different things. Um, I hope that made sense and was somewhat helpful. Let's go on to another one. And that's, again, why I like building these tools externally, too, because doing all of that inside an editor 
not easy. Doing all that inside of something like WPF or even in a web one, not too hard. The only reason I don't go with web ones is that the problem I've run into in the past is that people start working in their web browser and then they start playing YouTube video and opening up some other page and then the web browser crashes and I've lost all the data and then they're complaining, why did it crash? And you know, I don't know if it's my thing that crashed it or some other thing and they've lost their data. If it's in a separate tool, if something goes wrong, I can get a notification right away, get an automated email, hey, something crashed, blew up, go fix this right away, something's bad. Um, with a web browser, it's a lot harder to do that and doing something like that in WPF is really, really simple if you've done WPF before or you spend like a, I don't know, a week or two learning through a little course, you can, you can figure it out. It's not too complicated. Okay, um, ooh, I see some interesting questions down there. Let's see if, where we're at though. Um, why would I choose Unity for MMO development over Unreal? Um, you could really do either. I've done them in both. To be honest, there's not much difference. Um, the Unreal networking layer is generally better. I don't know if it's MMO ready now. It didn't used to be back in the day when I was using it, but it probably is by now. It probably works fine for MMOs too. Um, there's no real reason to use one over the other. I'd say use whichever engine you think is gonna be better for your general development. Whatever engine you would use to build games in normally is probably what you should use to build MMOs. Uh, I like using Unity just because it's, I love the engine. The, there are a lot of developers out there. There's a lot of info out there and I really like C Sharp. It's just my preferred language now. It also makes the tools development nice and easy because that's all in C Sharp too. So I can kind of bounce back and forth. But I wouldn't say there's any specific reason that you would have to go with Unity over Unreal or Unreal over Unity. They both work totally fine for that. In fact, there are MMOs getting built in both. Are MMOs fun to develop? Hell yeah, they're, I'd say, the most fun type of game to develop. They're also the most daunting and time-consuming and tiring. So they're, they're huge, they're fun. If you can get people in there playing it and you can get to the tipping point of, like, I have a game, it's great. If you're struggling to get anything out and you can't even get, like, the basic functionality going, it's probably less exciting. I would say don't ever try to build one solo because getting to that point is way too long and you'll probably never push over it and actually get to the really, really fun stuff. But um, I, yeah, I think they're the most fun type of game I've ever worked on. Um, and I can't think of anything more interesting to work on. There's just so many interesting big problems that you get to solve and different things you get to do in an MMO that you can't do in other stuff. By the way, um, if you guys don't mind hitting the like button, it really helps get people in here. So if you can hit them and just get that well over a hundred or something, that'd be awesome. Um, just so we can get more questions, more people in here, and really just because I like seeing the numbers go up. All right, let's see. What's next? Talking to, hold on, I got a that drink, it got me. So talking to servers and storing game data is a mystery to me and can feel daunting. How do you recommend learning this with Unity slash starting off with it? Um, I would start with uh, obviously outside of an MMO context and build something much smaller. Maybe a um, first a single like a two player game where you have two people moving around and store a little bit of data on the server. The easiest way to do it is just have a Unity instance that runs as the server as well. So you're sending messages to that Unity instance and then that Unity instance is writing off data. You can start as simple as just writing out to a local text file save off the player's data, maybe by their player name, and then load that data back up. Use a JSON serialization or, or whatever serialization you want. JSON serialization is just easy. It's just J-S-O-N. Um, and there's like the, there are libraries for it. So you can just take a class and serialize it out to text and then take that text and serialize it right back into the actual data. So that way you could have players like log in, get their level, they run around, they do something, then they log back out. Um, it's not too complex, but I would say start with a very easy one and start with an existing network solution. Don't try to build your own network solution for the first one. Try like a Photon or one of the other. Uh, Photon is just the first one that I went to with Unity, so it's like my, my fallback. But there are a lot of uh, options out there. Just find one of the network libraries that's out there that's for Unity and build something really small like that. Have it write data and load data and keep track of who logged in with some username. And you could even use like a username and a password that's stored in plain text for 
for your practice. Of course, you don't want to do that long term. You don't want to be storing usernames idea or passwords ideally. Um, and if you do, you want to be really encrypting them. But I'm generally a fan of not even storing passwords locally at all and having some other service that deals with it. Let's see. Um, what do we got? Where to start if you want to build the backend architecture? That depends on the um, end goal of the project. If the if it's just uh, you're trying to start off with a game and you're not sure where it's going, to start with, like I said, a, a Unity instance for the server, have that run. If you can build it so that it runs headless in Linux, even better, which is probably where you want to go. Like it's, it's nice to be able to start up a server in the editor and see your like get a server and a client running side by side, and you you can do that pretty easily and have it connect and you can see what's going on in there. Eventually, though, you want to be able to make sure that your server can build out to a headless instance and ideally a Linux instance, because if you're going to an MMO, you're going to want to scale up, and scaling up Linux is just dramatically cheaper because you don't have to pay for the Windows licenses. Um, so, But if you want to build up the architecture, you really have to think about a couple things. You need um, your server instances, whatever is going to run those. You need something that's going to manage those server instances. Um, a lot of time that, like I said, ends up being like a world server type thing where it's just a essentially a manager of your different zones or regions or whatever they are and keeps them up and down and then your clients connect to that and then that tells them what server or zone to connect to afterward. You also need some sort of data stores, either both for your content data and for your persistence data, which is like your player data. So your content data is going to be all the NPCs, items, quests, abilities, all that stuff. And then the persistence data is going to be all of your players, what items they have, what um, quests they've done, what level they are, where they where they last logged off in the world. All of that kind of stuff is going to be in a totally separate data store. I, again, really prefer using our relational databases. We're just starting to slip here. But... Um, there are plenty of other options for it too. You can use the NoSQL type stuff or flat files if you really want to. I just like relational databases. I find them easier to work with and easier to build tooling on and just, yeah, generally easier to work with and nice and simple to use. Uh, what OS to use for the server? Ah, um, ideally Linux. Um, I wouldn't, again, start off with worrying about that too much. First, get it working in your two editor instances. Once, you, once you've gotten past that, then start worrying about deploying out to Linux servers, ideally. Now, get a Windows version working first, because you're going to want to be able to run your server in Windows so that you can debug it easily and test stuff. Uh, but you also want to make sure that you get to something that's more scalable eventually, at least before you think about going live. Um, and ideally earlier, just because there are some weird things that happen when you go to Linux, and you want to be ready for them. If you were making a game like Fortnite today, what tech stack would you use? I don't know. I mean, if I was making Fortnite, I might just jump into Unreal because it's already kind of ready for Fortnite, right? They built Fortnite on top of it, and they updated the editor and the engine to be really good at it. So I would I would certainly consider just jumping to Unreal to build something like that. Um, I'd also, you know, being a weird Unity nut, I might just try to do it in Unity too. Um, but if you, if you don't have any real preference either way and you don't have any experience with either one over the other, I'd say just go with um, the engine that it was built in that they, they've updated it for. Have you looked into Spatial OS and do you think it can work for small teams? I have very lightly looked into it. I think it's a really neat concept. Um, I don't know enough about it to know how feasible it is at scale. It probably works fine. I've heard good things about it, but... I've also, you know, I've heard good things about a lot of systems and without checking them out, I don't really know myself whether or not it's a something worth or something that can handle it. Um, it seems like it's probably a, a good way to start off, um, but it does, from what I remember, it kind of locks you into their setup and the way that they do things, which could be good if you don't really have a plan for how you want to do things anyway. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I, I have a whole lot of insight onto it, into that, but I know that uh, Charles on Infallible Code, I think he did a, a lot of videos on that and a whole series on it, so it might be a good place to ask. And he, I know he does some live streams, too. He may be a good good guy to ask about that. Um, do you have any recommendations on the best MMORPG asset from the store? The only one I know of is you MMORPG, and I think if you want to build an MMO and you really have no idea how to get started, just grab it. 
grab it, start playing with it, start building and use it as a jumping point or a learning experience. It may or may not work as like a, a core bit of functional code that you're gonna use long term, but very least case, it's gonna give you a big jump start on how to put these things together, how to hook up client and server systems and have all that work. Um, I don't know the code well enough to know how good it is um, or how extensible it is, but I have played with it a bit and it was really easy to get working. And I think I, if I was building an MMO and um, hadn't built a bunch in the past, that's exactly where I would start. So I'd just jump into it, start playing with it, figure out how they do things, build on top of it. And then if you start hitting the limitations and problems, that's when you start thinking, okay, how would I do this you know, in version two or if I'm gonna rewrite things or change it. So that's, that's probably what I would look at. And that's definitely what I would look at and what I'd recommend. Just go and go grab it and check it out. There's probably a Black Friday sale on for it. Wouldn't surprise me. The thing goes on sale a lot and it's really cool. Um, is it important to learn game design patterns? If yes, then why? Definitely. Uh, if you don't learn game design patterns, you're going to end up with dirty, messy code. It's just what happens. If you're, if you're not understanding what patterns you're already using and knowing how to make those easy to understand, easy to read, and just really intelligible, you're gonna end up with messy, dirty code. Um, and if you don't learn just the general design patterns for code, you're gonna be missing a lot of opportunities to really simplify things. A lot of the time, like, people think that learning design patterns is hard, and it's really not. It's really just, um, learning design patterns is like picking up new tricks on how to make your code way simpler and way easier and just work better, and how to solve really problems that seem really hard with very simple solutions. That's all design patterns are, like simple, common, well-known solutions to problems that you have all the time. And you, the one thing you wanna watch out for is like, if you learn a new design pattern, don't go looking like, hey, where can I cram this in? Like, where can I make this fit? What you wanna do is like, get a problem and think like, hey, what pattern really works well for this type of problem? So when you have a problem, start looking for that. Like, what game design pattern works good for this problem. And you'll find articles and videos and stuff about it to learn how to use these and apply them in your own projects or your own issues. So definitely worth learning. And um, the biggest reason is because it's gonna make it so your code is clean and your projects actually get complete. You don't end up with a dirty mess of stuff that just constantly breaks. Projects get big, they break fast. Okay, I'm a 30 year old who just changed careers and I'm finishing my computer science associates degree. What can I do to stand out for a programming job? Program, code things. Um, make demos, right? create your own little games and share them. Put up a portfolio, put up some WebGL games. So just build some quick little games and publish the WebGL versions of them and let people see those and play them. If you just tell people that you just got a degree and they ask you what projects you've got and you've got none, you're at the bottom of the list below all the people who have projects that aren't, as long as the project's not total trash, um, it, you're gonna be way up there. And even if it is, you're still gonna be up above just from having projects and having done things. So I'd say work on projects, um, get a couple of your own little ones and just get them up and done and be able to show that you've made them. You don't necessarily have to show the code, but you have to show that you've built things. It'll give you a big giant boost there. Because I, I don't know how many programmers I've met who got a degree and couldn't create a simple program. Like they never actually wrote any code and they didn't know how to write code and they couldn't actually solve any problems. And when you're there hiring with, I mean, when you get hired to work on code, you're hired to solve problems. That's the whole thing. Like they want you to come in and here's the thing we want. Can you do this? They don't want you to come in and be like, I don't know how to do anything. So you want to be in there just building your own stuff and getting it out there and sharing it with people. And then if you can work on some open source or public projects too, that can help a little bit. Um, but getting your own stuff out there definitely helps a lot. Can you make a video where you show making a multiplayer game using TCP or UDP sockets? Um, I probably could do that sometime soon. Uh, I think I'll probably do one on using GNET though. Let's see, which MMO do you remember fondly as a developer and or player? Um, for a player, it was definitely EverQuest 1. I played that game a ridiculous amount. Like, I mean, thousands of days of played time on multiple characters. It was a giant addict and I, I just played it nonstop. I had a lot of friends who played it. So it was like how I hung out with my friends 12 hours a day. We would play EQ. Uh, if we weren't out 
somewhere we were playing EQ together. Um, so that was that was definitely it. And as a developer, it was Vanguard for sure, just because it was so much fun. Uh, it was my first one, and I was really into the game, and I just had a blast working on it. Um, yeah, I, I could talk about that thing forever, though, so I'll just continue on. Hi, I'm developing a game on Unity, and I want to add a multiplayer mode for one versus one using Steam peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, can you give me some advice? I don't really know where to begin. I haven't actually used the Steam networking library myself either, um, so I'm not really sure what advice I can give there. I don't understand it being too difficult to use it, but if you've never done any multiplayer stuff, it's probably not the easiest. In general, I found that the Steam libraries themselves tend to not be super beginner friendly, but there are usually assets on the asset store that wrap these Steam libraries or on GitHub. If you search for, uh, I bet there's a Steam Unity plugin for their networking system that really simplifies it a lot. And it's because they code their stuff for their own engines and uh, they code it in the way that they're used to. And it's a very C++ -y code and it, it can be pretty confusing as a Unity developer. So I'd look for an asset or a open source plugin that will help with that. Okay, um, oh sweet, we're up to 130 likes. Hopefully we'll get to 200 soon. Don't forget to um, hit the button. Also, if you guys have questions, I see some question marks appearing in chat. Just uh, drop them on the form, it's in the description. So I'm just going down the list because if I try to read chat, I'll miss half your guys' questions. So just drop them in there, just put in one question per thing and I'll um, hit them as quick as I can. Let me take another drink. Yeah, I see him get, oh, good likes are jumping up. Sweet, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, never trust user client inputs. I get it, exploits, cheats, etc. But you can't have everything happening on the server, can you? How do you decide what should be done on the server and what to validate on the client? Uh, yeah, you really generally do have everything running on the server. The benefit is that when you're running these servers headless, you don't have that rendering cost. You don't have the... Um, the big performance costs there. A lot of stuff can run a lot easier and faster on the server because it's completely invisible and you're skipping all of the hard parts. Uh, the one thing that generally doesn't get done completely on the server is movement. Movement is almost always client side, but then it's validated on the server and it's not even validated by like popping them around. It's more like if you move in a way that the server thinks is wrong and that's usually something as simple as like a, a distance delta, we check how far you've moved in a certain amount of time. And if you've moved too much outside of those boundaries, we just alert and uh, let, let people know and they'll start investigating and ban the person. Or we can auto ban them or something. But generally, we start off with something simple where we alert people that, hey, this person's moving in a weird way or they're going to a place they shouldn't get to. They're probably cheating. We go check them out and get rid of them. Um, and that's mostly just because moving server side, it's too laggy and it doesn't feel good. So you want to have them controlled on, on that client side. But everything else is definitely in, in the server. Um, I wonder if I just go to individual questions and have it stop scrolling. Let's see, where was that? Like 22-ish? Yep, watch this. Oh yeah, this is perfect. Now I can skip through and I won't even see the other questions until they pop up. Okay, thoughts on using AWS or Azure for your backend? Any good resources on using cloud stacks with an MMO? Any reason not to? So for anybody who doesn't know, that's uh, Amazon Web Services and Microsoft's Azure, which is like Amazon Web Services, same kind of thing. And it's just a hosted environment for servers. So you can spin up a server like a virtual machine, or you can spin up um, some services where you just, just run code without a virtual machine and we do that for, I'd say, almost every MMO. In the old days, what used to happen was people would rack servers. They'd get a data center. They'd rack up all the servers. Oh, I wouldn't, but guys like uh, my buddy Mike would. They'd go rack servers and wire them all up. And then if we wanted to scale up, you know, they'd be like, oh, no, let's go order quick. we got to go order more servers, find more space, uh, run more wire. In fact, when they launched EQ1, they actually had to tear up the streets and run more fiber to the data centers because it was overloaded. There was The connections were so overloaded that they literally had to be out there in the middle of the road after, like the week after launch, tearing up the streets to install new fiber lines to speed things up. Uh, now, Amazon and Microsoft and Google all have their own cloud platform where you can just 
you know, you want a new server, you hit add server or you change the slider or increment the number and suddenly you've got another server up in like a minute or so, depending on the operating system. It can be a couple seconds to a couple minutes to boot up a new server, or you can just have them kind of ready on demand so that they're already up and, and spinned up. Um, I definitely recommend them. Uh, they're, they can get pricey at scale for sure, but you can get reservations on the servers if things are going long term and that cuts the price down dramatically. And it's just cheaper than uh, running your own servers. Now, if you're in early development, whatever, just run the server under your desk, right? You don't need to, to pay for that and spend it. Or, But you can also get a lot of free credit from both of these. Uh, Microsoft, I don't know what they're still doing now. They used to give like 150 a month in free credit. And Amazon, I don't know what they're at now, but I'm sure they have plenty of plans that give you lots of free credit too. In fact, there was some deal that one of my friends got for... I don't know, it was a couple hundred bucks and it gave them $5,000 in, in Amazon credit just recently. So I would say look at look at the free credit options and the discount ones when you're starting out and then consider scaling them up. It's very, very easy to scale, scale these things and it really helps save you time and energy and makes so you don't have to manage a lot of extra stuff and kind of cuts down on the requirements for building an MMO. All right, next up. Do you suggest SQL or no SQL databases for storing data? And if so, what types of data is best for each use case? SQL integrates very well with C-sharp. Uh, so when something like Redis or Mongo worth the extra effort. Ah, Redis, that was the, uh, one of the other ones I was thinking of earlier too. It's one I love to use. Um, I am a big fan of SQL databases still. Um, I think that no SQL databases are sweet. Like they seem like they've got a lot of cool use cases. I just haven't seen a big payoff for them in MMO development. And that's partially because I want my data really structured usually. I guess it's, it might just be me, but in general with MMOs and just the content data or the player data, I don't want that really unstructured. I want it to be exactly matching with what the server is expecting. And I want it, I guess, very heavily structured. And the SQL Server makes that possible and not just SQL server, but like a Postgres, uh, MySQL, Microsoft SQL server, uh, even Oracle, although working with Oracle is always a pain for me. So I don't recommend it, but, um, any of those, I, th I just find them a little bit easier to use and they're a whole lot easier to build tooling on. There are plenty of tools like, uh, the one I was showing a little bit earlier, they just hook right into those and let you set up all the data kind of automatically. And I haven't found a real downside to using a SQL server. So I'm a big fan of going that route. Um, I know a lot of people who prefer flat files and no SQL databases, but I haven't ever seen a benefit from them in um, actual development for MMOs specifically. Now, if somebody knows of a good reason, um, I love to talk to them sometime, but I, like I said, I've never been convinced by it. There's never been an argument that's convinced me yet. Okay, have you ever tried Godot? And if so, what are your thoughts about it? I have not. Um, I've heard about it. it seems kind of neat, but it doesn't really apply to anything that I'm doing. Like, it seems like it's just a newer free engine, which is cool and all, but uh, it's just not something I've ever had a need for. Um, all the games I'm working on work in Unity. It works fine. It's fast. It, it handles all the problems I need, and I haven't found any reason I would want to switch yet. Let's see. What's something you've developed for an MMO that you are most proud of? Um a good question i'd say my favorite is ability systems um i got to work on a couple of them and it's just been fun seeing how you can make things extremely extensible so that designers can do whatever they want and build all kinds of crazy things um i'd say that's probably it. it's just ability type stuff and that's really when you think about it, in an MMO, abilities are the combat system. Like that's the majority of what combat is, is using abilities, things using abilities back and forth and those being interesting and unique and just making systems that make those interesting and unique is a lot of fun. Also, some of the tools that I made in the past, a um, long time ago, were really, really cool. Even one of the first ones that I made, which like, I'll admit the code is terrible for it, I'm sure. If, if the thing still exists somewhere, I'd be embarrassed to see the code. And it took me a lot longer than it should have, and it's buggy. But the first tool that I got to build was a database migration tool for content data. So designers could save their data off and choose, kind of pick and choose what things they wanted to promote up to the test server and production server very easily. So they could like switch to a branch 
work in that branch and then tell their lead to push that branch over whenever they were ready. And all of the stuff they'd been doing in that specific branch in their tool would just get pushed over and they wouldn't have to worry about it. It simplified things dramatically and saved a ton of time. Um, so that one was cool too. There are a lot of things like that though. I don't, I don't know which one I'd be most proud of other than the ability stuff is so fun. Um, no, you cannot. Let's see. <laughs> Did you ever think about creating and no. Okay. Let's see how many inappropriate questions we got here. Do you have any experiences setting up auto build systems? How would I set up a system to create a unity build where whenever somebody pushes a repo? Oh yes. Um, definitely. So there are a couple ways to do this. Um, what you'll want to use generally is some git hook. So if you do like, if you use git for your source control, you can set up a git hook that fires off a build system. The one that I've used most of the time is Team City, and it's just because it's C sharp. It handles C sharp projects well, and it handles things pretty easily. I, I just like using it, and it simplifies building quite a bit. It handles the whole build process, sending out emails, and automating all of that stuff. And then I've used like a Octopus Deploy to do deployments out to different servers. Um, there are a couple other options out there. So Go CD is one that. I've had recommended quite a few times. I've never actually used. And then there's, of course, the built-in Unity ones. I've tried playing with those before, but never at a large scale, uh, mostly because I'm impatient. And I didn't like to wait and wait for those things to finish building. So I would just do my own systems using something like Team City. Um, all right, let's see what's next. With old school RuneScape, you could log onto the server of your cho choice versus WoW, where you're locked into the server to make a character. I don't see games taking the runes, RuneScape approach. What are your thoughts on how to build slash separate your world slash servers? Well, in that case, it's more like you have one. So uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but in, in the WoW style scenario, you'll have servers where they have their own databases usually. So it's like a you've got a server and it's got its own databases and it has its own infrastructure. It's like this whole cluster of things that come up for each server and everything is associated with it. And then transferring stuff between them isn't extremely easy because you're you know, transferring data from one database to another and then remapping all of the IDs, which can be a giant nightmare, by the way. That's why server mergers and server transfers can be a huge pain in the ass if things aren't coded right or if things aren't really designed right from the database side to make it happen. And I say right, but I mean, if they're not designed with that in mind from the start, it can be really, really painful and slow. Uh, the RuneScape scenario, it's more like uh, you've got this one data store and then you're scaling out instances of the server. So it's like hundreds of instances of servers and you can scale that up and down and those are completely independent of the data store. Um, I think that the reason people, a lot of people prefer the WoW style the, the, or the ones that do is just because then you kind of have this forced sense of community where you're seeing the same people where with uh, RuneScape scenario, you're not necessarily forced into that where you can just switch over to another server and it's totally different people. Um, I don't personally have any preference on it and coding it isn't too much different. It's just whether you're connecting to a single source and everything's kind of tightly in that cluster or you're, or sorry, everything's, you're connecting to, yeah, the single one for your, your server, your game server, and then it's all in that cluster or you're connecting, you know, you've got just one server that's got all of the data and everything's connecting to it. And I say one server, but it's really like a cluster of servers too, just totally independent of those. Um, yeah, I, I would say you can build it either way. It's really just a matter of how you want your game to work and how you want that to happen. But if you do build where they're all separate, Make sure that you use something like uh, unique identifiers for your IDs for players and items and things so that you can merge and move these over easily because everybody always wants to do server transfers, server merges and stuff like that. And if you don't plan for it in advance, it's just a nightmare. You end up having to take things down like temporarily while data is transferring over. And uh, I've rewritten multiple server merge processes and I hated it every time. I mean... It was interesting and fun, but it's way harder than it has to be if you plan for it in advance. Okay, let's say you have an aggressive mob and they start to chase a player based on distance. Does that mean every monster has to calculate the distance to every player X times a second? No, not everyone, but every player, uh, well, really what'll happen is the, we'll have a, 
a quad tree that's got all of the data in there and or all of the entities in there and their positions and only things that are in the same little com I, I don't know if i can explain quad trees live um and get it get it cleanly but it's essentially when people are moving around the people who are in an area of interest is changing constantly so it's not comparing every npc to every player it's comparing it's taking an npc that's not already in combat that has other people in its little box so in its whatever region is and then it's comparing based on those and it's doing that um every x times a second or every once a second or something like that a lot of the time these things don't even tick like every second sometimes they're like every two three seconds uh, then it starts to feel weird though if that time gets to be too long so sometimes it would probably be about a tenth of a second we're checking to see if anybody's come in range but again we're only checking against the players that are in that little cell if they're not in that cell or there's nobody in that cell that npc can theoretically just go to sleep it doesn't have to process anything at all maybe it has to process a little pathing or something or it could be flagged to always process things but most of the time those npcs that are in a cell that doesn't have any players in it just sleep they don't process and do anything so they're just saving cpu time Okay, Jason, basically I need multiple servers in order to hold more than a thousand players on an open world RPG. How hard is it to have a thousand players along with NPCs? Um, it's not easy, right? This comes down heavily to optimizing that network layer and optimizing those messages. Um, the other issue that you're going to run into, though, with just that many people is uh, rendering too. You also have to be ready to render a thousand players or have a solution for that because it's a lot harder to address even than the networking side. The networking side is not easy to address, by the way. Having a lot of players on like a thousand plus along with NPCs, it, it it's costly and it takes a lot of CPU time. So you have to get it down so that you're not allocating at all and you're really minimizing the, the network cost or the cost of doing all that network data. Um, and just not sending too much data. The, another option too is to go with a more split out system where everything isn't all on one server. So where all of those thousand players aren't necessarily connecting to the same server and they're connected to multiple servers that are then communicating with each other. Uh, things get more and more complicated as you want to scale up though. So it's, uh, it's a big one. It's a hard one to solve. Um, and yeah, it takes a lot of time and a lot of work, but it's certainly possible too. Plus, with that, like your NPCs are not going to be sleeping very much. Can I run Crisis on this? Um, no. The ability editor brought a question to mind. Does, uh, by the way, Crisis is a game built on CryEngine, which is uh, it was actually the first one that I modded and played with a lot, and did a lot of level editing with. I, I had a blast. I really loved that game and the the editor and tools for it. Um, I never really got into using the engine though. Uh, the ability editor brought a question to mind. Designing systems to be modified in the inspector, which is what I generally do, seems like something similar to tool development. Does your ability tool export the data to JSON specific folders? Um, oh, no. So what it does is it saves directly to a database. So it goes through a service and then saves to a database. And then the game servers read from that database and from a cache so that it can pull the data as it changes. So I can save in one tool and then go over to just any old game client connected to the server, tell it I want to reload whatever set of data, and then it just pulls that. It basically pulls the delta, so it checks what's changed since then. So whenever you save something in the tool, we'll cache out the, or write out the timestamp for when it's changed, and then we'll just look at, hey, what's changed since the last time I reloaded? Just a simple, again, SQL is so nice for this. Just a simple SQL query, give me all the things that have changed since this in a single one-line call, and it just updates the cache with that. And then I've got the new data there um, instead of having to export and do a build or anything like that. And again, the main reason here is speeding up that turnaround time and development time for designers and make it so that designers can change stuff, get back in and everything just all their new changes are there, I guess, without any downtime. So that it's a couple seconds instead of a couple minutes and there's no big context switch. What can a small company do to deal with network lag since we have no real control over the route our data takes um well you have a little bit of control based on where you're hosting these servers and how they're being hosted the most important things to do though are using udp and um 
minimizing the amount of data that you're sending. You want to send as little as possible. Um, now, as for actually controlling the routes, I got no idea. That's kind of beyond anything I've done. But I would say generally going to something like AWS, I, I've had a, I've never really had a time when I couldn't find an AWS server that was fast. But again, I'm also kind of biased because my location makes it easy. Their data center is not very far from me. So I, I don't know beyond that other than I'd say you want UDP and you want to minimize what you're sending and receiving. You don't want to be sending and receiving anything extra or more than you need. Uh, obviously, when you're starting off, not, not the first thing to work on. But as you're getting to issues like this, you want to really optimize that. Uh, which books do you suggest for networking? Um, I don't know if I have any books to suggest for it. Um, if I think of any, though, I'll put them in here. I used to have a, a couple, but I don't remember what they are, and I don't have them with me anymore, and I don't remember what was in them. I wish I did. Um, do you think in this moment it is reliable to create an online 1v1 game where the player is the server? Uh, it depends. If you're not too worried about cheating, then yeah, it's fine. Um, if it's a game where you really have to, tr or you really can't trust the players and there's incentives for them to cheat and they're playing against people that they don't know, then no, you're going to run into the pro you're going to run into problems with that because people will cheat and people will disconnect as a server and other issues will just come up. So in that case, Depending on the kind of game, you're probably going to want to run some sort of a hosted server. Or um, for some other types of games, you know, think of like a asynchronous games, like a, where you're doing turn-based stuff. You might not even need like a real-time connection to a server. You're just sending messages back and forth to some API that's then reading or sending data back to your clients. And then you can have a very, very lightweight, scalable server that's really just like a a web service that you can scale up, you know, with a Lambda expressions or something else in AWS and just crank it way up and have it have it work easily. So it depends on the kind of game. Usually 1v1 games tend to not be super fast paced action stuff and they can get away with the turn based thing. Um, but if you don't care too much about cheating and that's not an issue, then you can get away with this as well. But if that's a big problem, yeah, you got to watch out for it. Of most games, though, it really doesn't matter too much because most of them, they're playing on a phone and nobody cares about leaderboards and getting to the top. And if you have a cheater, if they can't ruin your game, it's not as big a deal. In an MMO, a cheater can completely ruin and destroy the experience for everybody. In a one-on-one -on -one experience, they can maybe annoy one person. Okay. Any GDC talks you can recommend? Um, Not offhand. I'm going to switch back to summary mode. There's a lot of goofballs in here. Um, actually, let's go back. <laughs> um, any GDC talks that you can recommend? I can't think of anything. Um, there are a lot of good GDC talks in general that I like, but none like stick out as ones I would say you should definitely go watch right now. Um, does ECS work for WebGL? I don't think so. It might now, but it didn't last time I checked. I'd be surprised if it does. Um, I assume it will eventually though. Uh, what UI framework slash manager would you recommend for something as complicated as uh, an MMO? In that case, you're probably going to want to write your own. Um, it's going to be very big and very complex and you're probably going to need to write your own UI system for it. I haven't found a good one that really works great for an MMO personally. There might be something out there, but every time I've looked, there are always some downsides and things that just didn't work right with it. Um, or at least in that context, they generally were good for other stuff. Um, what's the most difficult part about creating an MMO RPG? Oh God, it, everything is harder. I'd, I'd say the hardest part is that every single thing you do is harder. Nothing is as simple as changing some state locally and reading some data and changing some state. Everything requires networking. Everything requires messages going to and from the server and validation on both ends usually. Um, and then getting it to, okay, I gotta go back to individual mode. Getting it to replicate right is, yeah, it's just, just whatever you're doing in an MMO, expect it to be just like building a regular RPG, but everything takes 10 times as long and everything's much slower. You have to run servers, debugging stuff is harder. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot. I don't know that there's any one part that's just the most difficult, but getting the networking layer right 
is very hard. Getting the inventory system right is hard. And I guess making it so that your systems are really extensible and that things don't fall apart constantly. It's very easy when you're building an MMO to make things really brittle and have systems where stuff just breaks constantly, where your code is, you know, you add in a new feature and some other random thing you never would have thought of broke. So that's what you really want to watch out for. Um, and the, the biggest issue I've seen. Let's see, what's next? Are you writing your own networking? I am not. Uh, Kyle is, though. Kyle is writing a new networking stack for a game, and it's uh, really great and I'd say pretty freaking awesome. And one day I'm going to convince him to hop on here and start talking about it as soon as he can. Like I said, that's all built on top of GNET. What computer configuration would you recommend to feel comfortable to develop on Unity? Uh, whatever the best thing you can get is. I would say... Um, well, the one thing you want to watch out for is you don't want to have a system that's too much better than your average users because then you'll end up not optimizing and not seeing performance problems. And if you're not seeing the performance problems until they get out to players, you can have a big problem because everybody's like, oh, yeah, it runs great. And then you give it to players and it runs like crap for most of them or half of them or whatever. And it can really, really destroy your game. I mean, that was one of the big problems Vanguard had when it launched is it ran really terrible for half the players, right? They're getting like one frame a second where everybody on a dev system is getting like 40, 50 because we all had super high end systems. So you want to make sure that you're not too high above the average, but definitely make sure you've got a good GPU, um, lots of RAM because you're in the editor, you're going to be doing a lot of stuff in there and a reasonable CPU. Also, a fast solid state drive. If you can get an M2 drive like the Samsung 970 Evo, uh, I highly recommend it because it'll make things much faster for importing assets and updating stuff when you're just working in the editor. Okay. I'm going to take another drink real quick. We almost have as many likes as viewers, by the way. Oh, maybe we can get it up over 200. That'd be cool while I'm trying to finish my sip. Okay, next question. In Unity, to reference objects, are options find, find by tag, and directly dragging them into a serialized field. Trying to avoid dragging and dropping as much as prop possible. Ah, okay. So here it's, this is really about components, right? So in Unity, when you're referencing components or game objects, you can find them um, by name or by tag or the one that I usually use. I almost never use find by name or tag. Instead, I'll use the find component or get component in child or get component or get component in parent. And then the reason for that is that it gives me a, a typed version. So I got my little brackets and I put my type there. And it's I don't know that it's necessarily any faster, but if I rename my classes, it doesn't break. If I rename a tag, everything in my code breaks. If I rename a game object, find calls break. In general, though, you want to do these in an awake and you want to cache them right when the things start up and you don't want to be doing them at runtime because it's slow. So you want to keep them, keep them there. Now for serialized fields, um, it, when you want to you use those when you want to assign things and it's not as obvious what the thing is. It's not on that same game object or it's not the only child that's that type. In that case, a serialized field works great, but one trick you can use is in on validate. You can override the on or implement the on validate method and then have it fill in your serialized fields using a find by tag or a find or a get component in child is really what I'd use. Like a get component, not so much a find by tag. I generally avoid those again because they're just not safe when you rename things. And when you rename something and your code breaks and you don't know why or when somebody else, usually what happens is you, somebody, a designer goes in and renames things because they're trying to help. And then everything breaks and you're like, oh, what the hell broke? And it takes forever because you're not thinking about, oh, maybe they renamed something. So I use get component, find object of type, um, and those things to, to cache stuff. Also trying to minimize mono behaviors. A lot of the time people use mono behaviors when they don't necessarily need to and just use a regular class that you instantiate in the awake sometimes. Depends on the scenario and, and the specific use, but it's something to just be aware of. You don't always need everything to be a mono behavior. Sometimes you do, so don't, don't think that you never do, but sometimes you don't need it. I have some experience with editor scripting in Unity. How do I get started making external tools for Unity? I would say you need to have a need for it first. So you need to have um, a scenario 
where you need to store data that um, is either not going to be easy to edit and add in Unity, or you need to store it in some other store, like data store, like a database or adjacent data store or something like that. I wouldn't necessarily just get to trying to build some tools for it outside unless you actually have a use case for it, because otherwise you're just kind of spinning your wheels and wasting time, and you're not going to really learn nearly as much as if you have a real scenario for it. Um, one thing to do is just go search for game development tool jobs. There are usually a lot of them open and not a lot of people apply. Might be a good way to um, get started with that, either for Unity or Unreal or even custom stuff. Um, sometimes there are two different types of tool jobs out there too. There's um, data heavy ones where you're working on just content data. And then there are some that are just very art heavy. So if you're looking at you want to make sure that you're looking at the right types of tool jobs based on what you want to do. Some, a lot of them are like art importing and art pipeline stuff. And then the other ones are kind of like that tool I showed earlier where you're setting up tools to allow designers to build the game and build out the content for the game. What's the best method of collaborating with Git when you're handed a project with little prefabs and one massive scene with no prefabs? Me and other devs are tearing our hair out at the one Unity file not being able to read changes. Um, a couple things you can do. First, you can probably consider splitting out the scene and get the scene into multiple scenes and load all of those scenes additively. So that way you can at least segment it out by um, different types of functionality. Get your particle systems and your content type stuff like your, your player controller type stuff in one scene your um, world and your environment in another scene and maybe interactable stuff in another scene. Split that out into separate scenes first and then start working on splitting it out into prefabs. Uh, scenes is just easier because there's less work to do when you want to go in and make those into, into separate things. But then, uh, oh, somebody asked me to zoom in. Hopefully that helps. Okay, so yeah, it's split into scenes and then look at prefabs uh, afterwards and start splitting into prefabs. Having one big scene like that is just a nightmare. There is a scene merge tool that you can use. Um, I don't really use it. Instead, I just split into separate scenes and it isn't so much an issue anymore. Also, not having too many things in the scene helps a lot too. So if your code is not all just game objects in the scene, it can be really helpful. But again, splitting it is definitely the, the simplest thing you can do. Uh, what advice or tips would you give somebody trying to learn coding from home? Uh, write code and build lots of projects. So just keep going in and keep making new projects and keep working on projects. The easiest way to learn stuff, at least for me, is by doing it. And it's what I'd recommend everybody do. Go build a bunch of games. Try um, building different types of games. Don't, don't stick on any one thing for too long. And just you know practice, practice, practice. Also, talk to other game developers as much as you can and just show them what you're working on, work alongside them if you can, and you'll pick up things a lot faster just working with other people and showing people your stuff and getting feedback on it really helps as well. All right, I'm getting really thirsty here. <laughs> Let's see. What else we got? If I decide to use a Unity as a game engine, what should I use as a networking backend? Um, this is gonna depend a lot on the game you wanna use. Like I said earlier, uh, we're building a, a custom one, well, Kyle's building a custom one on top of Gnet that works great. Um, there are a lot of options out there for different game engine or different network systems to get started with. I would try looking at some of them. I've used Photon in the past. I've played with Bolt in the past. There are probably half a dozen reasonable options out there that you can play with. Um, I don't know which one I would recommend using necessarily right now, though. Depends a lot on the game that you want to build. We said earlier that in case of server client architecture, presumably in relation to MMOs, yep, that generally speaking, anything but movement is handled server side. Does that apply to the buttery networking in relation to FPS networking? Um, no. So then again, the, well, I, I mean, it kind of does. Yeah. So the, the networking, the client is doing the movement and the server is doing the movement at the same time. When you want that really smooth stuff, they're both doing it and they're both processing and then the server is just making sure that the client's not doing something bad. The server's still moving them and then validating again with the client. Um, so in that case, you're doing both. If you're not, if on an on a MMO side, you're really just usually doing some validation and not doing the movement like that. But in an FPS, 
you're moving on both sides um, and then making sure that those line up and match and they should be in sync all the time. It's pretty complicated though. It's very fun to learn about though. Performance wise for MMO, does it matter to use four loops instead of four each loops? Nope, not at all. You will see zero performance difference there. Um, and you're going to have lots of loops and lots of things. What you want to look for are the expensive things inside those loops. So loops are fine. Doing expensive, costly things in loops often is bad. So you want to profile. And a lot of the time with an MMO or any game, the biggest thing you can do to maximize performance is just profile and look for it. Most of the time, the things that you think are the problem aren't the problem. And the things that you never thought of are a huge hit. And you just go in and fix them, and it's relatively easy. If you don't profile, you're just guessing and wasting time. Don't know what that was. My uh, non-English skills are terrible. Um, and I just didn't leave it up because I couldn't read it <laughs> in case it was something inappropriate. Um, sorry. If it was English, though, or if you can translate, that'd be great. If you were tasked with quoting an entire MMO project, how much would you charge? Uh, oh, five million, ten million? Or how would you even go about quoting such a large project? What are some categories you would have? So, I mean, quote, an MMO project is huge. And I mean, the scale of it can vary dramatically. It could be a very small scale MMO that you could build in a year. Probably not something that anybody really wants. Um, a larger scale MMO that's not like some special category that you know somebody's going to pay for for some reason that you could build in a year is going to take a lot of time and a lot of developers. It's not just programming. You need designers. You need artists. You need a full team to really build out one of these games. And I mean, yeah, you're in the many millions, I'd say, to build out or to realistically build one out. If you want, you can always, you know, hobby project it out and keep going and going. But you're, it's going to be really hard to keep up with things and technology and uh, new changes in the environment. It's They're just huge projects. They're not small at all. There's so many things. Every single thing that you remember, like everything you want to do is going to be 10 times harder in an MMO. Um so whatever you would quote for a normal game, multiply it by 10 and then probably multiply it by 10 again because you're going to need 10 more people, 10 times the people to work on it too. It's, they're, they're, they're huge. They're big. Um, I certainly wouldn't try to quote one realistically. If somebody asked me for a price on it, I, I don't think I could give one. They're, they're just huge. I have never seen one that was not in the tens of millions of dollars, though, that got released. Where do you draw the line on where to trust the client? Um, pretty much never. Never trust them. They're always lying. Um, validate everything that they send because it's always a lie. Um, oh, I just say, you always have to assume that they're lying because there's nothing stopping them from lying. And in an MMO, if they lie, they can ruin the play for everybody else. Uh, what are your thoughts on Atavism Online? I don't know. I vaguely remember the name. I don't know if I've played it or not. Um, I'm not sure. I'll have to check it out again. It sounds familiar, but I played so many MMOs, I can't keep track anymore. Um, how to start building an MMO, where to start? Uh, join a team that's already building one. That's what I would recommend. If you really want to work on an MMO, find an MMO development team or a company that's working on one, maybe even one that's um, open source or one that's been around for a long time and they've kind of bled off their developers and the developers have moved to other companies or other games. Try getting in on one of those, um, especially if it's like an MMO that you really liked to play and you're really familiar with, you know, and you feel like you can understand the engine at least a little bit and the code a little bit, try applying for that. The older it is and the, the less people are working on it, the easier it'll be to get into it uh, as a first time developer in there. So I'd look for something like that, or just again, look for something that's open source or public and see if you can contribute there. Those probably a little bit harder to um, pick up and learn from than if you're shoved into a, a real live production environment. But um, that's where I would where I would go first. Get some experience on a real one, watch those problems, struggle with them, and then take that to build the next one. But you really need a whole team to build an MMO. Um, what architecture should you take designing MMO client and server? Um, well, I don't know that there's a, a single word or sentence for that, but you really just need to have everything be again very server authoritative and very clean you want to make sure that everything's very clean and extensible i guess so that you can keep building onto it and not break things um, i'm a big fan of unit tests now too so 
if you can make your code all testable, it'll save you a ton of time in the long run. Um, we used to have giant rooms full of testers to test every build that went out. And if you can minimize that and reduce that, it'll save you a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of money. Um, but yeah, I'd say just most of the time though, like a, as a server scale or server wide setup, it's usually just clients, uh, zone servers and like world servers, something like that, that you've got built up where the world servers controlling zone servers and telling clients which ones to connect to. Let's see. Do you recommend any unity assets slash tools? Um, I like the Odin inspector. I've been using the doozy UI, which I think it was Jason's story that recommended recently. Um, and those are probably the two that I'd say I use most often for MMO stuff. I would check out the UMMORPG asset. Um, it seems pretty cool and lets you get started on an MMO really fast too. Let's see. We're building a game called Bomber Grounds. It's built with Unity and crossplay between PC and mobile 50 player battle royale MMO type design on AWS. What's your opinion on running lightweight render pipeline instead of normal where 60 FPS is important? Um, I, th I don't know. Uh, so since the lightweight render pipeline came out, I haven't worked on any mobile projects. Um, and it's just been a side effect of the stuff I've been working on. It seems like it's probably the right way to go, especially with 2020. But um, like I said, I haven't had the, the problem to solve yet where I needed to, to do that. So I'm not completely sure what the, what the best option is there. Um, it seems like it's probably the way to go and it's the way that things are going forward. Uh, getting art assets for those pipelines tended to be a little bit harder depending on if you have a full team building them that knows how to do it or if you're contracting or hiring people or buying assets. If you're doing that, it might be harder to make that swap. But um, if you're not and you can make the assets for it, I don't know of any downsides to it. If anybody does, please just drop a comment though and let people know. Oh, and somebody else I saw mentioning Jason's uh, note about uh, Dootween. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's good for a lot of simple UI stuff and moving objects around. Definitely something to use if you're interested in that, but uh, it's not something to use in MMO development particularly. Um, the, can I share the architecture design of client server with list of use technologies? Sure, most of the time it ends up just being Unity and um, some sort of SQL server or Postgres or some other database. Um, I've used all of them and Oracle uh, along with some memory cache like Redis, Memcached, something like that, that can run in AWS. Generally, right now, I use AWS for most of the stuff, just using some of their services. You can even use the RDS databases to manage the database so that you don't have to run that and actually manage it and maintain it and just have it auto scale as well and keep costs down a bit. Um, and that's about it. And the, other than that, it's just uh, UDP messages through uh, some network library that you want to use. Uh, like I said, the recommended one from a buddy Kyle is GNet. So that's, I'd say, where you should look first. Can you name a good engine for open world sandbox MMOs? Um, I don't know of any that are specifically for that. I don't know what would be a great option for it. I, you could definitely do it in Unity or Unreal, um, but it'd be some work. There's probably something out there that that does it where it's just automatic and scales, but I don't know that the engine is going to be great for everything else. There are a lot of like pre-built solutions that can really help with that kind of stuff, but they might lock you down in other ways. So it's just kind of a trade off on whether, how you build the stuff. If you want to build the open world giant stuff uh, yourself, or if you want to build a lot of the other things like the rendering pipelines and the, the tooling and stuff yourself. Um, but I don't, I don't know of any specifically. I know there were some like years ago when I looked, I don't remember the names of them. We looked at all of them and decided not to use any of them and went with Unity. Um, no, I do not. What programming pack practices and patterns? Um, so look at the game programming patterns book. You can read it online. I would say if you're interested in design patterns, programming patterns, and just clean code, check that out. It's got lots of cool stuff. Um, it's not so much in a C sharp context. But I also did some videos. If you look on the channel under game programming patterns and solid principles on my channel, 
you'll see a lot of those uh, same concepts in there too. But I'd say look at that book too, uh, Game Programming Patterns. You just Google it. You see his book. It's good stuff. Um, lots of useful information there. How's your team integrating a network layer upon Unity? It's just a uh, DLL. So it's just a, a network library built that um, the engine will use. It's all in C Sharp. It's actually pretty pretty easy to use. It's kind of surprising. It's, it's not too hard to just swap it in and out. Currently running on an old ThinkPad with an old video card and not much RAM. I'm sure I should upgrade the RAM, but I want to know what's most important to get out of the hardware. Um, yeah, the video card there is really weak and the RAM is weak. I would say if you can bump, I mean, the video card, if it's a ThinkPad, it's going to be really hard to do, but you should be able to get some RAM for relatively cheap. I'd say definitely upgrade the RAM if your laptop can handle it. I don't remember that one specifically. Uh, if you can go up to 8 gigs, it'll make a relatively noticeable difference, I think. If you can go up to 16, it'd be pretty big. Uh, but then the video card is also going to be kind of a limiter on that. I, I don't know the stats on an HD 4000, but I assume it's lower than any NVIDIA or, or API card. Also, I don't really like to develop on uh, laptops in general just because I like the performance and cost, the cost per performance of a desktop plus just the real estate and the ability to just load up screens. Uh, monitors are relatively cheap, so I got three giant ones here. I can see all kinds of stuff and see different windows, especially for MMOs. I want to have a client here, a server there, some code here, and be able to bounce around really easily. All right, is learning Unity a better industry decision than learning custom engine development? Yes. If you want to make games, yes. If you want to build engines, then no. If you want, if, if you want to be an engine programmer, then learning how to do that is very important, and learning how other ones work is very important. If you just want to build games, Learning Unity or Unreal is way, way better. You're going to actually be able to get a job doing it. Um, if you don't know how to use the engines that people are using, it's a lot harder to get those jobs doing doing development on them. Um, I would definitely stick with that unless, again, unless you want to be an engine developer. Some people like to do it. I've known like three in my life um, that were really into that kind of stuff. They didn't really care about building games. Uh, they cared about building the cool technology and the engine stuff instead. They had a blast doing that. If that's what you want, then uh, that's the route to go. But it's there are definitely a lot less jobs for that. Um, the jobs are like at places like Unity working on the engine or at custom shops where they have their own custom engines usually. There aren't many people editing the engines in actual game dev shops. There are some, but not very many. Um, what are some RPG cliches that you like or don't like? Um, I have no idea. I, I yeah, I just like RPGs that are fantasy. I, I've never really been too much into sci-fi RPGs, but I'm building one now because it's fun. Fun to try and something new, um, at least for MMOs. I guess I, I like them for single-player stuff. I, I don't know that I, that I have anything, though, on that. What would be a good rule of thumb for caching variables and data? Cache um, anything that could change that you would want to be able to change very easily. Um or that you're going to be accessing a lot. There's two different two different instances. So for caching variables, like anything that's slow to look up or slow to get, you want to cache it. And anything that's going to change often, like design data or content stuff, um, I like to cache that and then always read directly from the cache. So two different types of caching, like caching like a local instance or a local reference to the object for things that are slow to look up. And then just using an ID and looking up the object in a cache by ID for data that wants to change often, like a new items or something like that. Um, design patterns, I think I hit that one a couple times, so I'm going to skip ahead. If CCU is 2, is it possible to turn my PC into a game server? Um, I don't know. Concurrent, is so that's concurrent? Uh, I forget what CC It's two users max at the same time. Um, I don't know the answer to that one. I'm not sure what that is. Have you ever thought about an MMO like Ready Player One on top of something like blockchain? Uh, yes, I think that a Ready Player One MMO will eventually exist or Sword Art Online type thing will eventually exist and Elon Musk will probably be the one who brings it. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, I don't know that you would need any blockchain stuff for it though. Um, I think it's a cool idea. I think it'd be fun and it might just kill society, but we'll see. <laughs> If you haven't seen Sword Art Online, just go check it out and watch it. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's really cool. It's like jumping into an MMO and playing it for real. 
Um, I probably get really tired after a while, though. I don't know. That sounds fun. If you're looking at a personal project from somebody applying to be a junior developer, what are the main things you would hope to see them doing in coding that project? In that coding project, um, I mean, ideally having somewhat clean code that's readable, having variables. Like oh, an easy one is having variables that are named what they are, not having your variable named like AP3 and PO1 or whatever and random crap like that. At the very least, name your variables and methods well so that it's easier to follow and understand the code. Also, make sure that it works and it runs. Um, don't send somebody a project that you hit play and it doesn't work. Like Send it to yourself, test it multiple times, test it on a new device, make sure that it's good before you send it out. I've seen lots of people apply for jobs with code that they submitted that didn't compile and was full of errors and they, obviously they didn't even get past that step because uh, like if you can't be bothered to make sure the thing that you're sending is actually valid, um, you know, how can they trust you to, to do that on the thing that you're committing? So uh, that's about it. Other than just uh, get some projects and build some things and put them out there. Build something that's kind of fun to play ideally too if you can. It's something small though. Keep it, keep it very tiny and time boxed. If you're giving people a demo, you want them to be wowed in, at like the 30 second mark. You don't want them to have to play for 10 minutes to figure out what the hell the game is. You don't want it to be overly complex and you don't want it to be too simple. You want it to be like, what I'd recommend is take an existing game that's very easy to build and very easy to understand and then put in some little twist on it at like the, the 15 to 30 second mark. So people go, oh, hey, that's cool. I, I recognize this, I know how to play it. And so they get in, know how to play it instantly. And then you introduce some little surprise. And then they're like, oh, I didn't expect that. And that, that's what's gonna push you ahead really easily. Uh, thoughts on Star Citizen? I don't know, I was really hyped about it. I thought it would be really cool. Um, I've tried playing it a couple times and it wasn't what I was expecting yet. I'm hoping that it gets to what I'm expecting, which is like a giant space-based MMO. Um, I have no, I, I don't keep up with it though, because I just kind of hop in once a year and try it out. Um, last time, I think I, I flew around for a little bit and walked around for a little bit and then decided to wait until next year. So I, they've got a ton of money and a ton of development. Um, I hope it ends up being a fun, cool game. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure where it's at now though. I, I'm like I said, it's probably about at that one year mark where I should go give it another shot. Um, how do you go about validating things like user movement? Um, a simple one is to just do some timestamp checks on their their speed. So what we can do is like every second check where they moved, how far they moved, and check what that movement speed is. If that movement speed gets to be too high, then hey, we look at it. The other thing you have to watch for though are like teleportation type things. You need to make sure that those aren't triggering it so that you're going through a different code bait or a different code path for those that's letting you know that, hey, this is actually a valid movement. Um, that's just one way to do it. There are a lot of different books out there and articles about it. Um, so I think one of the books I still have back there, Exploiting Online Games, talks a bit about that. Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice. I think I'm gonna wrap this up in like the next 10 minutes. I'm getting really thirsty and talking a ton. <laughs> Okay, I have a strong outline for how various game systems would be would specifically interact and overall feel for an MMO project and can certainly summarize each element at whichever scale. With only surface level knowledge of the development itself, is there a way to pitch the entire project and work from there, guiding it from above with a clear vision? Um, if you're famous or rich, yes. If you're not, it's probably gonna be nearly impossible because a lot of people have really good game design ideas and pretty much everybody building a game has some idea of what they wanna do. Um, but, sorry, people knocking on the door. Um, everybody pretty much has some idea of what they wanna build, but getting other people to go build your idea is nearly impossible, again, unless you've got a lot of money and you can pay them and bribe them or you've got a very famous name and you can kind of draw people into it. Um, it Otherwise, it's you know it's like you go to any game company and you ask for game ideas. There are everybody's got you know two to ten, and they they all think that they're great. And it's really hard to push yours up, especially if they're not you know people that you already know that you're kind of guiding and motivating there. Server side collision and pathfinding. 
Uh, pathfinding, definitely. Collision for some things. So for player movement, basic movement, you don't necessarily need to do your server-side collision there. For things like a fireball flying into stuff, you may very well want to use some server-side collision. Pathfinding, definitely going to be server-side for an MMO. Oh, hold on a second. Deliveries and dogs, huh? All right, next up. How do you handle databases? Every example I see online, people hide it behind a web front end instead of having direct database access in the Unity software. I assume the concern is embedding server info, but can't that be handled as a start parameter? Um, even embedding the server info isn't so much of a problem because your database connection is only going to be on the server side. It's not going to be on anything that your clients are going to see. And realistically, it's probably going to be in some configuration file that your server is reading from. The biggest downside to reading directly from the database is, um, I mean, there's, of course, some security concerns, but the bigger thing is that it's harder to scale. If you're reading from an API, like a web service or something, you can easily throw a cache in front of that and then just read directly from the cache and not have to hit your database often at all. And then you can save money and save time on the database calls. Um, there's no reason that you can't just directly access the database from the server. You just want to make sure that you're not shipping that with the client and you probably want to have it inside some sort of a virtual network so that things outside of that network can't access the database, don't even know that it exists. Yeah, my dogs go crazy every time a delivery comes and it's Black Friday time so there's uh, lots of deliveries coming. Um, do you have, I don't know what that is. So I'm going to say no. I wish I did. Sorry. Have you implemented tracing and KPI reporting, and how do you handle it? Um, not a whole lot. So in most MMOs, the reporting is more around like user activity, what people are doing, what items they're finding, what things they're killing, how fast they're leveling, that kind of stuff I've done. And usually what happens is... There's a bunch of logs for that, and then it's getting parsed into another system and then transformed into usable data. And that's just because most of the time people don't build in reporting systems directly, but they build in log systems so that their game masters can go in and see what's going on and look through stuff. So I set it up. I, I've done this a couple times where it just reads through the logs constantly, watching for updates, and then updates some, um, some data store for it. I don't know what I would use now, Back in the day, I used some OLAP systems, but I don't think that that's necessarily the right way to go anymore. I think there are a lot of other systems that just make it easier to take all of that data and report on it. And you just want to get this stuff that's going to be actionable. There's a lot of data you can track, but if it's not stuff that is actionable, like that's going to point out problems or point out things people should work on, then it's not worth um, worth getting. It just can be extra confusing. So things like what items are getting dropped, how many items are getting dropped, how fast people are leveling, what NPCs are getting killed, that kind of stuff is pretty important. Or how much damage a specific class is doing. Like you wanna know like how much damage do rangers do in on average against in fights at each level and compare that to everybody else. And you can kind of get all of that data out. That you wanna not necessarily get from logs. Well, you could, but you, you have to think about it a little bit more and just kind of track it and save that stuff off. Let's see, I'm trying to answer the rest of these real quick before the, the hour hits. If you were to plan to become a successful game dev, would you suggest learning all parts of game dev? Art, modeling, Unity, Unreal, and music design? No. Um, pick one and get really good at it. There are very few companies that need you to code and do music and do art and all that stuff. Um, you want to pick one and focus on it and get really good at it. There are a couple people I know that are pretty good at all of them they all still have a preference for the thing that they do best and the thing that they're really good at. If you're trying to do all of them, you're just kind of diluting yourself and not getting as much of whatever the important ones are. So pick the thing that you care about most and work on that the most. Um, work on all of the other things a little bit, understand them a bit, but don't necessarily try to get all of them to maximum level. Just get comfortable enough that you can manage them. All right, can UNET be used in production or is it more for prototyping? Um, UNET is deprecated. I would recommend not using it for production at all. Um, you can play around with it for prototyping, but it's going to be gone soon, so I wouldn't even necessarily go that way. I'd say find a, a different network solution for sure. How are you dealing with collision detection? Server calculated or client? I think I just hit that one a minute ago. Let's see. Um, using UNET, don't. 
and any recommendations for MMO projects a programmer with no games can do? Um, yeah, again, I would say grab that UMMORPG asset, try it out. It, it'll help get you like a starting point and give you an idea of how MMOs can can be built. Um, it'll show you, it's, it's just like a nice out of the box solution that lets you have an MMO. And then the other thing I would say is uh, try to apply at some MMO companies. Try to go work at one for an existing MMO, not something that's necessarily fresh in development or huge, like don't go apply for WoW, but go find an MMO that's, you know, slowly dying or dead or whatever, you know, or just has a lower player base and try to go work on that. It's easy to get it way easier to get in than it is to go get in on some big hit game. Um, and you'll get a lot of experience. You also see a lot of the problems and meet people, make new connections and be a lot easier to get into, you know, big scale MMOs later, if that's what you're interested in. How do you decide what functionality should be split into multiple scripts? Um, by use. So it's by the thing that it does. Um, each script I like to have do one thing generally or handle one thing pretty well. Um, sometimes that's not the case and it handles two or three things, but it, I like to logically separate them as much as possible. If I can separate scripts, I usually do and try to get them into many, many smaller scripts, especially if I can use some abstract base classes and just swap out the implementations with different little scripts. That's great. It makes everything easy to read. If the code gets to be more than a couple hundred lines long, I'll almost always just force myself to split it because I go, hey, there's definitely some seams here, some spots where this stuff can separate, and I'll look for them and split it out. Um, it's definitely a skill that takes a little bit of time and practice, but just looking for anywhere where things are different. Oh, but somebody mentioned UMMORPG is half off right now. Oh, it's only 20 bucks. That's a deal. Um, so yeah, I just split it out as much as possible um, and get scripts as small as possible most of the time. Um, so if you're thinking like, hey, is this too big? It probably is. Uh, any recommendations for integrating input slash finite state machines? Inputs changing depending on the state with assets from the asset store. For example, I want to try it with do the UI. Um, I guess that's, that's a lot like um, swapping out implementations with um, abstract classes or state machines. Uh, I don't know if I can give a good recommendation on it right now just because I'm getting really thirsty and out of breath. Um, but I would say it's definitely the kind of thing that you want to do. I just don't have a good recommendation for it right this second. Uh, what's your favorite game, if any? Um, probably Magic the Gathering still. I still play it a lot. Um, play Arena now online and play with friends. And what are you hoping to see come from cloud gaming with the new streaming stuff, Stadia, xCloud, et cetera? I don't know. I don't have any big hopes for it. I think that it could be really cool if it simplifies things and simplifies deployment and makes it easier for people to get their games out. I think the bigger, the bigger shift is going to be that, you know, if your game is on those systems when they come out and you can get them out there and out to people, you just get more viewers fast. Um, I don't know that it's going to be, kind of thing that's available to every developer though. So I, I don't know that it's going to make a big shift for like smaller indie devs, but I think for bigger companies, it's going to be just another platform where they can get things out and get people playing games easily. Now it could also help a lot with um, scenarios where people don't have big beefy gaming systems. Um, I just happen to have one because I work on them all the time. So it doesn't impact me as much. But I can definitely see the benefits there. I think it's going to be cool. It would be interesting to see how it goes, though. And um, I'm kind of excited to play with Stadia myself. Let's see. What else do we have? Wait, did I miss one? Oh, what do you think about Spatial OS? Uh, I mentioned earlier I'd recommend checking out Charles' videos on it. I haven't used it much myself, so I'd say go check that out. And he's got a whole series on them, um, which I think seems pretty interesting. But... So I haven't had a, a use case for it myself yet, so I haven't really dug in. Um, Pantheon, what is it using? Uh, custom stuff on top of Gnet. And, oh, more spatial OS. And no question, but thanks. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up there because if I see any more questions, I'm going to um, keep answering and I'm going to run out of breath and pass out. So I, I don't know if you guys thought this was helpful or you guys have a lot more questions. Um, if so, just share it and drop comments in the description or down below and stuff. Cause if it gets really popular and has a ton of views, I'll just do more of these and talk about it. I was also like I said, going to try to do some live development for just MMO stuff, building actual server code 
and uh, let's switch to camera mode and showing what the server code looks like, showing how it looks to refactor that stuff. So if people really want to see that, um, drop a comment below. And like I said, if this thing is big and popular, I will definitely do that kind of stuff. And well, as soon as, if I, assuming I can get approval, do that and we'll go through some actual code. We'll do some real refactors and see kind of uh, what real big game code looks like in a real situation. Um, let's see, anything else? I don't know if I had anything else. Um, I guess I just wanted to say thanks again. And remember, just hit like and share and all that stuff because it does help a ton. And um, I'm trying not to pass out <laughs> out of breath. Oh, somebody asked me to talk about the new course. Um, I'm kind of out of breath right now, but if anybody's interested, you can check it out. It's at uh, game.courses slash architecture. You can see it. It's um, and talk a about some of these things, not so much MMO development, but more just uh, game architecture stuff and projects, um, how to build bigger projects. Again, not quite at the MMO scale because it's, it's like, I don't know, years of stuff, but so somewhere along the way. Um, and again, yeah, if you guys have anything else, um, always feel free to drop comments or send me an email. Uh, it's just, yeah, my name at, at my website. And um, I think that's it. All right, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Uh, lots of great questions. It was fun. Um, I have to do this again soon. <laughs> All right, bye, everybody.